As people reach middle age, that means as we begin to grow in the middle outward, <laughs> I woke up some of you. Okay. We tend to ask the question, what is life all about? When you are young, you know, in your 20s, you don't really ask that question that much. But as I said, when you reach 50 and over, you begin to be more serious about the remaining years of your life. And you tend to ask yourself even more often, what is life all about? What is life all about? This is when some men, I don't know about women going through this, this is when some men go through what they call midlife crisis. Midlife crisis. Because they struggle with the question, why can't I make sense of my life now? Why can't I make sense of my life now? This question sometimes is triggered by the following. One, uh, failure in fulfilling a man's dreams or goals, or a little confused or unsure about their future. These are some of the reasons why some men go through what they call midlife crisis. On the other hand, some men go through a midlife crisis while they are wallowing in their material success and prosperity that don't really give them a real sense of meaning in life. Classic example, King Solomon, the wealthiest man in the Bible, who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, where he said, everything under the sun is vanity. So there are two reasons why men, some men, go through midlife crisis. Either they think they're a failure, or they are success, a smashing success in their careers and their lives, but there is no meaning to their lives. Throughout the centuries, philosophers and theologians have pondered this question about life's purpose and meaning. What is life all about? What is life all about? Some said, life is all about me. It's about all the pleasures I can get with my mental, physical, and material prosperities that can buy all the pleasures I want. The hedonist, the Greek hedonist philosophers have said that 2,000 plus years ago. And that is still the philosophy of a lot of people today, even in America. The secularists, the hedonists, people who have no material, I should say, who have no spiritual values, that is what they are thinking, you know, life is about me. And yet, friends, just recently here in America, the suicides of some of the most prominent and wealthiest celebrities warn us that life is more than just material prosperity and physical pleasure or pleasures, as Jesus said in Luke 12, verse 15, where Jesus said, Watch out, be on your guard against all greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. We are very possessions-oriented and minded as an American society. This is what is in today in our culture. This verse from Jesus is very appropriate for us to ponder once in a while because it says life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. So now we are addressing this crucial question about the purpose and meaning of life. What is life all about? Well, the Bible teaches that human life is really about having a fulfilling relationship to God and to people that is motivated by love for God 
and love for people. I was sharing this with the Tagalog service this morning. I delve into this quite deeply. I don't have to do that now. I have no time to do that now in the English service, so I'll just give you a broad outline uh, regarding this. So, recently, uh, my wife and I were discussing our lives, you know, in our morning devotions. And uh, we have looked back to the days when uh, we gave our hearts to the Lord Jesus. We were in our early, actually 21 years old, when we gave our hearts to the Lord in the ministry. So, we, we kind of assessed and evaluated our lives uh, as to what happened to us as a couple in the past 55 years. And we came to the conclusion, friends, that life is just about two things. Life is about loving God and loving people. And actually, the ministry is about two things, loving God and loving people. You know, you can go to seminary and get a Doctor of Divinity or Doctor of Ministry or Doctor of Theology degree studying everything about there is to the ministry. Actually, there is none more than that. Life is about loving God and loving people. The ministry is about loving God and loving people. In other words, life is all about relationships. Relationship to God and relationship to other people, which is the text for today's message. Please look at the screen as we read together the greatest commandment and the second greatest commandment shared by Jesus to an inquirer. Matthew 22, verses 36 to 40. Teacher, the inquirer, ask, which is the greatest, the greatest commandment in the law? The law here is the Torah, the central part of the Old Testament, the Torah. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So I check the word neighbor in the Greek and in the context of the conversation of Jesus with the inquirer. I was shocked to uh, learn that the word neighbor in the Hebrew context simply means anybody you come in contact with who is in need. Because to the Jewish mind, a neighbor is a fellow Jew. A Samaritan is not even a neighbor because he's half Jew. So a Gentile is not a neighbor. They were called dogs. The Gentiles are called dogs by the Hebrews. So uh, Jesus expanded the meaning of the word neighbor to mean a neighbor is anyone you come in contact with who is in need. And he gave, of course, you know, the parable of the Good Samaritan that was triggered, triggered by the same question about the law. Right? Now, I added to this uh, 1 John 3, 4 for a reason. When, when I was studying this text for today's message, my mind went to uh, 1 John 3, 4, where John said, Everyone who sins break the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. Everyone who sins break the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. Lawlessness. Um, I want to uh, kind of give you a deeper background on this text, although it can stand on its own. It doesn't need my comment for you to really understand it, but let me just share with you from a preaching point of view. The message of the Lord Jesus, according to most Bible scholars, or all Protestant and Protestant and Catholic and evangelical scholars is the kingdom of God. The message of Jesus was or is the kingdom of God. And the law of God's kingdom is love. The Magna Carta, the law of the kingdom is love. And the ethics, the moral teachings, the moral standards of the kingdom of God 
is also love. If you notice, the word ethics has S, but it is used in the singular form according to the dictionary. So the ethics of God's kingdom is love. And the bond of our relationship to God and to people is love. So it's all about love. So I did a fact check about this, although I don't know how to use the computer. I just researched it. Did you know that although the main message of Jesus was or is the kingdom of God, but Jesus talked more about love than about any other subject in the Bible? Yes, his message was the kingdom. But within this kingdom message, Jesus talked more about love than other subjects in the Bible. And do you know what he talked less or, I should say, next to that? Money. If you study all the parables of Jesus, uh, the majority of them, more than two-thirds of them, concern about money. What does money have to do with love? Or what does love have to do with money? Because we understand it is repeated over and over, especially by St. Paul later on, and even Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, that you either love God or money. You can, you can love God and money at the same time. Right? So, so the, the ethics of the kingdom is the law of love. Okay. Now, I want to say two things in your bulletin. You may want to fill up the blanks. The essence of God's moral law is love. The essence of God's moral law is love. Another filling the blank there in your bulletin, love is not lawless and love is not one way. Let me explain that. What do we mean by love is not lawless? Oh, we just quoted 1 John 3, 4. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. So if love is lawless, you cannot break anything. There's nothing to break. Correct? So uh, let's understand this because this is a, a teaching today that's becoming more and more popular and affecting other people. There is a book written uh, called One Way Love. It's becoming, it's becoming more and more popular just uh, like the teaching on grace. Okay, so love is not lawless. Jesus said, I came not to uh, break the law, but to fulfill the law. Now, does it mean because Jesus fulfilled the law, the law is gone? It cannot be. Because, because the moral law of God is based on what? Love. So how can you delete that? How can you remove that? You can't remove that, right? So, love is not lawless. So, understand that when Paul said, you are not under the law, he's talking about the ceremonial law given by God to the Jewish nation, like sacrifice uh, animals, shed their blood, sprinkle the blood, blah, blah, blah. That's the ceremonial law. That's gone. That was fulfilled by Jesus on the cross. But when Jesus said, you are not under the law, but under grace, he's talking about the moral law, not the moral law. He's talking about the ceremonial law. Now, uh, when, we say, when we say that God is uh, love, and we say that the ethics of his kingdom is love, we are saying that we are still governed by a law which is called the law of love. Amen? Okay. That's why this uh, greatest commandment is never abrogated. This greatest commandment remains. Amen? Okay, so why do we say love is not one way? Okay, let us explain that. Love is not one way. Uh, there are those who say this, okay? God loves you. That's it. You don't have to respond to the love of God because it's one way. Whether you receive it or not, God still loves you. If that were the case, where is conversion? If that were the case, where is repentance? If that were the case, where is love? Meaning, even if I choose to reject the love of God because it's one way, I can never violate anything. So I'll be safe forever. Do you understand now what's being taught on the airwaves? Right? So, uh, God is not one way. God is two way. It can, never be, it, can never be, it can never be one way. You know why? Because of this. God created humans with a free choice. And love cannot be love without free choice. You cannot love a piece of stone because this piece of stone cannot love you back. 
So when God created angelic and human beings and gave them free choice, God took a big risk. Because God knew that the free choice God has given you and me and angels can be what? Used against God. But that's necessary for us to have because how can we love God without a free choice? If we're just wired and programmed like robots to love God, that is not love. So we're saying love is not one way. God is two ways. Because God has given you the gift of free choice to exercise your love for God. God did not wire you to love Him without you knowing it, right? God gave you the free choice to love Him by choice. Amen? Now, there's a famous saying uh, by St. Augustine, uh, one of the foremost theologians of the 4th century, which is misunderstood by a lot of people. St. Augustine said, Love God and do whatever you wish. Love God and do whatever you wish. Wow. That gives us a lot of freedom. I mean, love God and do whatever you wish. You know what St. Augustine was saying when he said that? If you really love God, your wishes will be within the will of God. You will not wish anything contrary to the moral law of God if you really love God. Amen. Right? For example, what's the first commandment? No other God but me. Right? Now, if you really love God, you cannot worship Somebody else besides God. That's why, that's why St. Augustine said, love God and you are free to do anything you wish because you won't do anything contrary to the law or the love of God. Amen? Okay. Let me just share with you quickly some biblical reasons for loving God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind. Now, what makes these two commandments impossible to uh, Fulfilled in our own human strength. The first word is the word all. All. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And the second commandment, what makes it impossible to uh, practice? Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, let's be honest to ourselves. How many of us can really say we love our neighbors as we love ourselves? Can you say that? Can I say that? If we are really honest, none of us can say that. Can we? Right? So, uh, the, point, the point here is this, from a psychological counseling point of view, there are those who say, uh, you must have a degree of self and healthy love for yourself before you can love somebody else. Actually, if you don't love yourself, you can love other people. That's acceptable. We understand that. We understand that, right? But, but to, to, to really apply that literally, I believe none of us can actually do that. Love God as you love yourself. None. So why did... Jesus gave this commandment. This is the ideal. This is the ideal. This is the standard. Actually, this law is pushing us to, toward God, and this law is pushing us toward the cross because we come to the point where we say, this is impossible for anyone to fulfill this. I cannot do this. And Jesus said, thank you for understanding that. You can really do that. That's why we need salvation. That's why we need grace. That's why we need forgiveness, right? Okay, so... Biblical reasons for loving God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind. 1 John 4.19 gives us the reason. John said, we love because he first loved us. 1 John 5.3, in fact, this is love for God to keep his commandments. His commandments are not burdensome. So the love of God did not remove the commandments. The love of God just gave us the grace and the strength to keep the commandments. So uh, when Paul said, you are not un under law, but under grace, he's just simply saying, you are no longer tyrannized by the law that you cannot fulfill. Amen. You now can fulfill the law by the grace of God and the love of God in you, but the love of God, the grace of God doesn't remove the law. It just 
strengthens you, qualifies you, gives you the ability to, to keep it. So there is a growing misunderstanding in the church world about love and, and grace. It's being abused in many places now because of these wrong nuances and interpretations about the love of God. That's why we are pointing this out to us. Okay? Now, let's go back to 1 John 4.19 again. We love because He first loved us. When I was young in the ministry, I used to preach this. Uh, this is what I thought was symbiotic love. Okay? Meaning, I scratch your back, you scratch mine. Okay? It means, uh, you love me, I love you. That's fair. Do you know, uh, later in life, I discovered that's not the intent of John when he said that. Actually, what John is saying, with the love that God loved you with, now you can love. In other words, in other words, left to ourselves without God first loving us, none of us can love God anyway. You get that, right? So, why do we love God? What are the reasons for loving God? Because He first loved us. So, somebody said, God gives to us what He demands from us. He demands from us love, so He gives it to us. So now we have no reason to say, I cannot love you because I don't have the ability to do that. Yes, you are right, but I've given you this love. So John said, we love because he first loved us. Now here is the application. When we find it increasingly difficult to love anybody else besides ourselves, just check on ourselves. Is it because maybe we didn't really receive the love of God yet? Or maybe even if we have, a very small part of it. Because as we grow in our love for God, as we receive more love from God, it's easier for us to love other people. Amen? Okay, say for example, I don't even love myself. I hate myself, some people say. I don't like myself. I'm angry with myself. I reject myself. It's a huge emotional, psychological issue among a lot of people. That's one of the reasons for depression, actually. So when we come to the point where we know God loves us, when we know God accepted us, when we know God forgave us, then we can begin accepting ourselves and loving ourselves in spite of all the things we don't like about ourselves. That is when we begin to be able to love other people. Right? Okay, so why do we love God? Because He first loved us. And with the love He put into our hearts, we are able to love Him back. Okay? We're not just saying, okay, here is an equal deal. God, you love me, I love you. No. Even if God loves you on your own, you're going to love God back. You don't have the capacity to do that. You are a sinner. I'm a sinner. Amen? So, uh, when John said, we love because he first loved us, John is simply saying, empowered by the love of God you receive, now you can love God. Amen. Second reason. Because God loved us while we were unlovable sinners. God loved us when we were unlovable sinners. We read in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If you are a careful student of the word of God, you will see something here. While we were, past tense, still sinners, meaning now we are no longer sinners. Do you get the connotation? While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So what are you now? Are you still a practicing sinner? No, you are not. If that were the case, this text means nothing to you and to me. It says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So uh, this is the second reason why we love God, because when we were unlovable sinners, Christ died for us. How did God demonstrate his love for us? By sending His Son, Jesus, to die on the cross for us. Amen. So now, here is the big encouragement. If God could love you and me while we were unlovable sinners, how much more now that you are a child of God? Amen. There are times when uh, we uh, question the love of God or doubt the love of God, like you're sick, you lost your job, your wife divorced you, your husband ran away for another person, woman, whatever, or man. Uh, sometimes it happens. 
Actually, I know somebody, his wife ran for another woman, okay, not, not another man. Uh, so, so uh, uh, <laughs> that's another story. <laughs> what I'm saying is this, friends. If God could love you and me while we were unlovable sinners, how much more now that we are God's children? Amen? So don't ever, love, don't ever doubt the love of God for you just because you are having a hard time in your life today. You know, what, whatever struggles you may go through, we all go through struggles. There's, there's something we never should doubt, and that is the love of God for us. Just keep on reminding ourselves, if God could love me when I was a rascal, now God loves me because I'm one of his children. Amen. Third reason, okay? God is treating us as true sons, not illegitimate children. This important teaching that we all need to review once in a while. The writer to the Hebrews said, and have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, my son, it's a quote from the Old Testament, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart or get discouraged when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines, or the King James says, punishes the one he loves. And it chastens, punishes everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all human fathers who discipline us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They discipline us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good, in order that we may share in His holiness. Now, the big question is this. When does God discipline us? When? I don't know. I don't know. You know God deals with us uh, on a case-to-case -case basis. Uh, God is not so easy in belting us. You know, uh, He is very compassionate. He is very patient. He is very loving. And I personally believe this. If God deals with you and me on a consistent basis, He tells you exactly what is displeasing Him about your behavior, about your life, and you harden your neck, and you ignore God, sometimes out of the love of God, He will have to discipline you. And how does God discipline us? What does God use to discipline us? All kinds of things. Sickness could be allowed by God. So this popular teaching, God doesn't make anybody sick. I disagree with that. You can read that again and again in the Bible. Sometimes God uses or allows sickness to discipline a person who is hard-headed. Sometimes all of a sudden your life goes haywire. Your relationships break down. Your job, your business, your friends, your relatives, all of a sudden they want to turn against you. Why is that? What's that? Sometimes behind the scenes, friends, God is working. What I'm saying is this, the difficulties, the hardships that God allows to happen to us are not always caused by our sin, but they can be. So when we are going through prolonged trials and difficulties and it seems that there is no light ahead of us, just stand and think, is there anything amiss in my life? Am I Doing something, thinking something, planning something, scheming something that displeases God. And I know he talks to me about it in bed and when I'm awake. But I'm just, you know, kind of pretend I don't hear it. Sometimes to get our attention, God will have to discipline us. Why does he do that? Because we are not legitimate. We are genuine. We are legitimate sons of God. Amen? Hallelujah. Fourth reason 
Why uh, we love God is because He promised at least seven blessings. Hallelujah. Seven blessings. That's a lot of blessings to those who love God. Uh, Psalm 91, verses 14 to 16. Uh, we read, Because He loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue Him. That's rescue Him being blessing number one here. I will rescue Him. Blessing number two, I will protect Him. For he acknowledged my name. He will call on me, that's prayer, and I'll answer him. That's blessing number three. I will be with him. That's blessing number four. In trouble, I will deliver him. Blessing number five. I'll honor him. Blessing number six. With long life, I'll satisfy him. Blessing number seven. So which of these blessings do you need today? All of the above. All of the above. Actually, if you lump together or put together the six former blessings, they're all about long life. This long life could be your physical life on earth. And of course, of course, when you read about that salvation, it talks about your eternal life. Amen? So, uh, I just mentioned this to us in order to encourage us and motivate us to love God because... He has seven blessings for those who love him. He has seven blessings for those who love him. Amen? So, people who truly love and obey God have a higher chance of living a long life. How many of you want to live to a hundred? To a hundred. My dad almost made it. He died when he was 99 years old in seven months. He, he thought he was going to see Jesus come in his lifetime, but... Uh, uh, he passed away before that. Uh, uh, really, uh, in the Old Testament, actually, salvation is more physical than spiritual. In the Old Testament, salvation has to do a lot with your physical health, you know, your financial standing, your prosperity, your relationship with other people. But of course, when Jesus came, he expanded salvation to mean more than that. But uh, in this context, the seven blessings that God promises to those who love him is long life. Long life. Now, uh, personally, that's why we are discussing this next Sunday. It's not just long life we want. Because even if I live long, if I'm not healthy, I don't want to live long and be a burden to uh, anybody. Right? If you and I live long, uh, I want to uh, be like Moses. You know, Moses died when he was uh, 120 years old. And he was told by God, by God, climb Mount Pisgah. And uh, a study was made, Mount Pisgah was long and stiff. There was no way for a 120-year-old man to climb that if he wasn't in good shape like Pastor Allen. Right, Pastor Allen? Okay, and the other marathon guys here. Amen. So, uh, uh, I, I think this is a good incentive for us to love God. You might say this is self-serving. I, I agree to some extent. It is, but it's a good motivation. Amen. So, there are rewards promised by God for loving Him. And we lump them together under the title, Long Life. And uh, to me, uh, what I want to see is not just long, but healthy. Long and healthy life. Amen. I'm only 76, so uh, I don't know how long I can live here anyway. So, the, the, the biblical proof for loving God. Okay, we're down to the last point now, the second point. Biblical proof for loving God. We don't want to belabor this. Uh, it, it is the word obedience. The word obedience. Uh, we read in John 14, 15, Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commands. So love is a contractual relationship. It's a contract. It's a contractual relationship. If you Love me, keep my commands. What commands are you going to keep if they are all gone? Right? If you love me, keep my commands. Or the word for that is obedience. Now, without sounding legalistic, let us transpose this to something else. Okay? It still falls under the word command or law. What was the first command even ever given to mankind? What was the first command? Do you remember? 
it goes back to the Garden of Eden. God said to Adam and Eve, you are free to eat of all the fruits of the tree in the garden except one. Don't eat of that. That's the first command. Did you know that's the first command? So what we're saying here is this. Even if you want to deviate a little bit from the Ten Commandments or the other commandments, just this, okay? When God talks to you directly, to your conscience, to your spirit, to your mind, through the Word, through the Holy Spirit, and, and you know exactly what God is telling you. You either obey or disobey. So how do you prove your love for God? Put aside the Ten Commandments for a while. Put aside all the other commandments for a while. Just, just consider this. Whenever God confronts you and me and talks to you very clearly about something, that's a command from the Lord. If God says, stop that, that's a command. And he says, do this, that's a command. Right? Say, for example, God said, Organize your time so that you are more present in the service than absent. That's a command. If God says, organize your finances so you can honor me with your tent, that's a command. If God tells you that, God, God talks to us. As I was sharing a while ago, why is this? The, the attendance has decreased, the giving has, has increased, and somebody told me people grew in the grace of giving. It, it's one of the indicators of spiritual growth. Why? Because somebody heard the command of God to up their giving and they obeyed God. So how do you prove you love God? You do what he tells you. The bottom line is what? Obedience. Amen. So the Great Commission. So we talk about the Great Commandment. Now we're going to talk about the Great Commission. The Great Commandment and the Great Commission. The Great Commandment and the Great Commission. What's the Great Commission? Matthew 28. What's the Great Commission? Make disciples of all nations, teaching them to what? To obey everything I have commanded you. So what is Christian discipleship anyway? Is it studying the Bible, knowing the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, Quoting verses from the Psalms uh, and the uh, New Testament, the Old Testament, is that what discipleship is all about? No. Discipleship is about obeying what Jesus said. In other words, I can have a doctor of theology and know the Bible left and right, even in my sleep I can quote it. If I don't obey it, I'm not a disciple. I'm just a student. Amen? So what is discipleship all about? According to Jesus, obey everything I have told you. This is, I think, where the church needs to be uh, awakened uh, one more time or reminded that, that when we disciple, we must understand what Jesus is saying. A disciple is one who obeys me. Bottom line. A disciple is one who obeys whatever, everything I commanded you. That's what a disciple is, right? So, uh, the biblical proof for loving God or being a disciple is obeying, obeying what God says to us. Okay. If you are allergic to the Ten Commandments, put them aside. If you are allergic to any commandment, put them aside. Just simplify it like this. Whatever God is telling you, that's a commandment. If God tells you uh, to be more careful when you're driving on the freeway, that's a commandment. God has told me that several times, so I'm more careful now. I don't race anymore. Right? Amen? Some of you are sleeping, so you didn't hear my story. <laughs> so, uh, if God tells you, treat your wife more nicely, that's a commandment. If God tells you, respect your husband more, that's a commandment. In other words, whatever God is telling us to do or not do, it's a commandment. Yes. Amen. Amen, somebody said. <laughs> okay. Wow, my time is up. Yes. I'll just quickly parrot to you the biblical ways to love others. Do good to them. And them means everybody. Galatians 6, 9 and 10. Let us not become weary in doing good. How many of you get weary in doing good? I do. You all do. In fact, last Tuesday, uh, I announced to the staff in the staff meeting, I want to take a one-year sabbatical. I said that right, Pastor Monte. Because 
I have been pastor in church for 28 years. I have not taken much vacation yet. I, I deserve a sabbatical. <laughs> and uh, Pastor Lopez said, go for it. Go for it. Okay. Uh, uh, th that was the first time I ever confessed to the staff that I was tired. I never do that. We all get weary in doing what? Good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. So what, what's the point of doing good? Reap a harvest. You know when we get weary, it's when we do good and do good and do good and do good. We don't see harvest coming. That's very wearying. So for example, we have this new ministry here, uh, food distribution, just the second month. If we keep on doing this forever and we see no harvest, it might weary some of us. So let's pray for harvest. Amen? Amen. We're not just doing good just to be do-gooders. There is a reason for our doing good, and that's to reap a harvest. Amen. You see, we evaluate our ministries. Rick Warren says we have hundreds of ministries that we just stopped because they didn't harvest anything. So be, be ready to just change course when it's necessary. Amen? Now, after saying that, let me just remind you that even if you are doing the best thing you could for the Lord, it is still worrisome. Do you know that the people business is the most worrisome business in the world? You are a nurse, right? Many of you are nurses, doctors, eh, 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 counselors eh, like Pastor Allen. Uh, because you hear people's problem, uh, without you knowing it, their problems get into your psyche. You go home, you think you, you left your... Your, 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 your job at the office, no, you don't. You, don't. you, you can't leave that. It becomes part of you. It's, it's worrisome. And, uh, and a pastor, uh, it, it's worrisome to, to lead a lot of people like this congregation. I'm not saying anything wrong about you. I'm just saying it's part of the job, right? For example, I'm confessing now. One of the burdens that kind of worry me now is the $2.8 million debt. We have to pay off that building, to be honest with you. Uh, because I want to, to leave this pastorate with this church debt-free. So uh, if you have no uh, million dollars, at least you can pray for three people to donate one million dollars each, okay? <laughs> one million dollars each. Or give us wisdom on how to use that facility uh, so that it will begin to pay for itself, Right? And just like a normal daddy, you know, uh, you fathers, you, you, you have family, and if you are in debt as a, as a family, you are burdened by that. Uh, as a, as a, as a quote-unquote father of this congregation, I'm just using an analogy, I carry that burden. And uh, I'm praying that God will alleviate that burden. Uh, God will uh, give us some uh, miraculous donors and uh, pay this up. Amen. Some of you might even win the lotto. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not into that. <laughs> I'm not into that. Okay. You cannot win the lotto because you don't buy tickets, right? Hey, somebody said, supposing somebody gave it to me, just gave it to me. Or found it, you know, in the ground. All kinds of excuses. <laughs> okay. Okay, how do you, how do you, how do you uh, love others? Do good to them. Even those you think don't deserve it. Okay, after a while, you get tired doing good to the same person who doesn't even say thank you. It's one of the weariest things. Some people think they deserve it. They deserve it. Maybe they do. But they don't even acknowledge it. And you get weary. Right? They think they're entitled to it. Maybe they are. But you, who is the giver, get tired. And thirdly, how to show love uh, to other people is this. Colossians 3, 13 yet, about forgiving bear with each other, forgive one another. Actually, this is one of the one another verses of Paul. Paul is very famous about the one another, one another, one another, one another. Talks about relationship. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. What makes this difficult? As the Lord forgave you. How did God forgive you? 99% or 100%? 100%. Thirdly, honor them above yourself. Romans 
12, 9 to 10. Love must be sincere, not put on sincere. Hate what is evil. You see the contrast in the words love and hate? Love is a strong verb. Hate is a strong uh, verb also. Love is not a noun. Love must be sincere. In this case, it's a noun, but actually it's a verb. Love must be sincere. So when, when Jesus said, love God, that's a verb. When Jesus said, love your neighbor, that's a verb. So he said, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. This is, unless you know God and have Jesus, this is not easy to do. Uh, human nature says, me first. I'm it. I should be number one. Everywhere, anytime. If I can manage it, I should be it. That's human nature. That's contrary to what uh, the Bible teaches, you see. Uh, actually, if you uh, remember the disciples of Jesus, just prior to the crucifixion, just before Jesus went to the cross, they were quarreling along the way. Who will be on his right? Who will be on his left? They even used the influence of their mother. Mother, talk to Jesus. In the kingdom, ask Jesus to, to place me on his right hand and uh, on his left hand. They were still politicking among themselves just before the crucifixion. So honoring other people above ourselves is not easy, but that's how we show love. The more of that we can do, the more of that we can say as an expression of our love for others. And number four, live at peace with others. Wow, this is a huge one. Paul said in uh, at Romans 12, 18, if it is possible, okay, that's the premise. If it is possible, if it is within your decision, if it is within your reach, if it is within your, your, your capacity to do it, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Wow. Live at peace with everyone. Do you, know that, do you know that this everyone starts at home? Do you know that? Sometimes we think everyone is, oh, you know, that next door neighbor there, you know, my, my loud neighbor there who parties a lot and disturbs my sleep. That's the one. As I started this, the more I'm convinced that everyone actually begins at home. Right? Everyone actually begins at home. Amen? It begins at home. Okay. Why, why do husbands and wives quarrel? I don't know all the reasons. I know some of the reasons. Why do we get upset with our husband or wife? Me, personally, I'll confess. My wife's right there. When I'm talking and it looks to me, she's not listening, I get upset. She does. She always does. But... Like me, she's also a type A personality. What's a type A personality? She can, she can drink her coffee. She can stroke the dog. Uh, she can watch the news and talk to me at the same time. And then it looks to me, she's not listening, and I get upset. In other words, I'm a boy sometimes. I demand attention. How many of you can say I'm a boy sometimes? I'm a girl sometimes. When you think you are deprived of the attention you need, you get upset. Somebody said, yes. <laughs> wow. So, peace. Shalom, right? Okay, so, so how, how, how do I correct that? When I'm upset, I tell him I'm upset. Are you listening? She says, yes. You are not looking at me. You are looking at your coffee. You are stroking the dog. You are reading your Bible. We are having a devotion and I'm talking. You are listening. I don't do that anymore, I, you know. Sometimes I do that, but uh, not anymore. I mean, I learn. I learn, you know. What's the lesson? Peace! Peace! Okay. My wife will kill me when I get home now. She already killed me a lot of times. I just resurrected. No, you know, I'm closing now. Uh, back to my introduction. Okay, so 55 years of marriage and ministry. 
we came to the conclusion that life is all about relationships with God and other people. The ministry is about relationships with, that, with God and other people. People will hurt you. People will hurt you. You know, uh, uh, the most hurt I ever got in the 55 years of ministry was in this church. That might surprise some of you. Was in this church. When did it happen? In the last 10 years. How did it happen? When we merged the two congregations, there were those people who didn't like it. They made, they made my life miserable by, you know, fabricating all kinds of stories against me that, that were not true. I cannot go into detail. Into that is over now. I'm just telling you that uh, in the ministry, people can hurt you. Who, who hurt Jesus? Judas. Who else? Peter. Who will hurt you in the ministry? People closest to you sometimes. In other words, if you want to be a PhD or a DD, be a PhD in God's love and a DD in God's love. <laughs> right, so, so we are closing, we are closing now. When you stop and think about it, friends, life is just about relationships. Relationship to God and relationship to other people. At the end of the day, actually a few years after I die, actually right now I can tell you, People will forget. You will forget what I have been preaching in the past 28 years here. There is something you will not forget. How you perceive us, my wife and me, to have loved you. All our talk, all our summarizing, all our teaching, they'll all be forgotten. There is one thing that people don't forget. It is your love for them. So, uh, <laughs> hallelujah. Anyway. So, uh, the topic today is vital relationships, right? So, if you want to improve and, 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 and grow our spiritual life, just ask God. Just I'm asking God all the time, every, every morning, this morning especially, that God will give us, uh, you know, the, 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 the capacity, uh, enlarge our hearts and our minds and our understanding to be more loving to God and to other people. Because by nature, we're all selfish people. When I say we're all selfish people, we love ourselves. That, that's selfishness, right? So uh, the more we become Christ-like, we become more loving. We love God because he first loved us. And we love other people as God loved us. That's how we build our relationships stronger and deeper in the Lord. Father, we thank you this morning. For your very simple but very difficult teaching. Lord Jesus, you are inimitable. You can simplify the most complex subject like the law into a very simple statement but also impossible to, to do without you. We understand, Lord, that we cannot love you with all, all, all. All our heart, all our soul, all our mind without you giving us that love first in our hearts. We also understand, oh Lord, that we cannot, we cannot love ourselves, we cannot love other people as we love ourselves because our tendency is always to love ourselves. So we cannot love other people as we love ourselves apart from you. Help us to grow in these two areas, Lord. We want to grow in our relationship to you in our relationship to other people, beginning with the people closest to us. Our own wives and husbands and children and grandchildren and relatives and friends and fellow church people. Lord, how can we, how can we love the people so far from us when we cannot even love people within the reach of our hands? Help us, O oh God. Help us, O oh God. Help us to remember, Lord. Help us to remember. When we close our eyes on this earth and wake up in heaven, He will ask us, Did you love me? As you should. Did you take advantage of all the resources I place in your hands to love me? Did you love other people? As you should. Help us, O oh God, on that day not to be embarrassed by our answers to you. 
Lord, we know the Christian life is not complicated. It's just about loving you and loving other people. We understand that Christian discipleship is not complicated. It's about obeying Jesus and putting into practice the teaching of Jesus. Lord, I pray raise up a congregation here who will grow in these two areas, Lord. We are reminded, O oh God, by your prophecy that in the latter days, because wickedness will increase, the love of many will wax cold. And also we are reminded by St. John, love not the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life are of the world. Father, we just rededicate our life to you this morning.